All right, y'all, welcome to another episode of She Will Not Fall. I'm excited. Of course, season two is all about liberation. And today I have my friend, Tyranny, who is joining me. So welcome to the podcast, Tyranny. Hey, so good to be (laughs) here on the podcast. Yes, Yes, I'm excited. Like I knew when I was planning season two, you were going to be one of the people I talked to because of the topic. So I was like, yeah, we need to have a conversation about liberation. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I'm excited um, I'm excited yes me too so a way to get to know you um and I know this is hard but we're gonna do it we're gonna get through um if you had to describe yourself as a song title or a book title what would it be and why um so first <laughs> of all we have to acknowledge how difficult of a yes. question this is because like, it's a very hard question one just one to describe me like I am yes. literally all of the things yes. um <laughs> so I was thinking I was going back and forth if I want to do a song or a book so I landed on a song and then I had narrowed it down to like three songs and I was like girl she said one not three follow instructions and so I landed on free by Brianna Sullivan Sharp and so um if I think about myself, I think about someone who is free, someone who is free from certain things, striving to still become free from other things, um, and who wants to holistically embody freedom everywhere I go, every everyone I encounter. I don't want to have to, um, I don't want to be bound by anything. I want to, I want to show up and be free from all the things that people said I was or wasn't supposed to be doing. And, and the more I was thinking about it, when I was deciding on the song, the words in the song, and as, as she's telling her story of how she got to freedom and how some days she feels a little less free than others. I was like, yes, cause this is a journey, right? So yes. I'm free, but I'm still on the journey to freedom because we ain't never really arrived. It's always more work to do. Yes. And so, yes. Yeah, so that's, that's my song. That's my word. Um, that describes me and who I am and who I want to be and who I'm striving to be each and every day I love it because there's levels to freedom like there's levels it's levels to this okay levels to this okay um I love that like I feel like there are days I'm like oh my gosh I'm free and then there are days I'm like lord I'm still shackled what is really good Like what is really happening? Like I thought I was over this. How do we get here? How do we get here? Like, and I feel like that's Mm -hmm. constant. I think either I wrote it somewhere. I don't know because I be doing things and forget. But I wrote it somewhere where liberation can consistently change day by day. Just depends on what that looks like for you. And I feel like that's a good segue into the very first question that I have for you. So I know that there is a communal definition for liberation, especially for groups of people. But I always like to ask, what does liberation mean to you personally? Like, how do you define it? What makes you feel liberated? What do you need to feel liberated? Yeah, I think this is a beautiful question. So when I hear the word liberation, the first thing that comes to mind for me is authenticity. Um, If I am liberated, I am free to be my authentic self. I am free to show up in all of the facets of who Tierney is. I could be the country girl from Macon. I can be a little ratchet sometimes. I can I can be a little bougie sometimes. I like nice things. So, you know, it's, it's levels, like, right? It's all, it's yes. levels to this. Um, yes. And so being, li- being liberated um, and embodying liberation, the first thing that comes to mind for me is authenticity because I never want to be bound up into a box that somebody told me I was supposed to fit in I don't want to have to show up into a room oh well can I wear this can I say that which parts of me are they going to be able to digest which parts of me do I need to kind of calm down I want to be able to be my authentic self in every space and arena that I show up in absolutely because something I was talking about with another guest is Sometimes being your whole authentic self and being in a space for that is a privilege because I think there, how can I put 
privileges. There are people who have that privilege where they never have to do anything else. But I think there are those of us sometimes we have to code switch, though we do not want to. Um, and I think when we embrace authenticity, that's rebellious and that's resistance, which I think is necessary for liberation. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, because I'm getting there. there it, yeah, it's a subversive element to it, right? So I've gotten to the point when I'm doing my real work, I don't put on my phone voice anymore. This is the voice you're going to get. I don't I do not do the tyranny phone voice that I yes. learned through undergrad and through, you know, trying to be quote unquote professional and all of those things. You you ain't going to get the phone voice. You're going to get you're going to get tyranny. And sometimes yeah. it's a little African-American vernacular English is thrown in there and you just going to have to rock with it. You just going to have to be OK. And so that's one of the things that I have um, been able to to do as far as you were saying about, you know, code switching and being authentic and being true to who you are. That's something that I've gotten to the point that I can actually do and live into. I love, I love it. it. For me, it's my hair. <laughs> like yes. I used to be really concerned, especially like when I first started working, working, you know, like not the little part, but like a full-time grown up mm-hmm. job. And I was like, oh my gosh. And I remember because of what my name is, most people think a white woman is going to come in the room. And I was like, I was terrified to wear my natural hair to an interview. And I was like, oh my gosh. So I did not have my natural hair out at the interview, but baby, when I started that job, oh, <laughs> the the baby Afro at the time came all the way out and I was yes. these big areas. I did not care. And I was like, no, this is who I am. So it has definitely been that one day I may have my, my natural hair out. The next day I may have on a wig. The next day, wherever I feel, that's what I'm going to do. Cause I'm that's like, how I'm showing up that day. Okay. That's how I'm going to show up. That's how I embrace my authenticity. That's liberating for me. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. To be free in your authentic state, to show up yes. as the black girl that you are. My hair does yeah. not grow out of my head straight. Okay? okay. And y'all can get these braids and this wig and this crochet <laughs> and all in the same week. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like Monday through Friday is a different me. Uh-huh. Like, I love it. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about the work that you do and how liberation is showing up in the work that you do. Yeah. Um, so by profession, I am, ooh, this is, this is the first time I ever had to say this out loud on the podcast. My yes. God today. Um, I am a minister. I am um, an ordained pastor. I serve at the faith community of Atlanta. And so that is my job job. Um, I do a little consulting work on the side and then I have my own podcast, which is, you know, through my personal ministry. So it's all ministry adjacent. Most of the people yes. and spaces that I work with are, um, either nonprofit or church basis. So I'd be in the ministry world. And um, a lot of the work that I do and con- desire to continue to do um, is focused on um, sexual and sensual liberation. So the um, the connection group, as we call them, that I lead at the faith community is called Let's Talk About Sex. And so we do disruptive sexual ethics. We talk about topics that are quote unquote taboo for people. We are trying to liberate you sexually and sensually and help you unlearn and relearn and just learn things that you didn't know about your body and how that connects to your faith and how that connects to your spirituality. And my podcast operates in the same vein. So sensuality is one of the key components that I desire to unpack and help people explore through the work that I do in the podcast. And so one of the main things that I want to do is help people be liberated sexually. Um, and then kind of secondary after that, um, I I want everything that I do to be practical. So like practical theology, curriculum writing is kind of like my bag. That's where I am. And so in the writing that I do, in the conversations that I have, I want people to be able to be liberated in their spirituality, whether that looks like identifying as Christian plus, whether that looks like identifying as somebody who believes in the spirit and God and not having to put a name on that, being comfortable in expressing yourself spiritually, however you see fit. And so, um, so yes, so 
the, the sexuality and the practical theology is my bag. That's that's where I like to spend most of my time and most of my work and helping people to understand that your body is not innately bad. There's nothing wrong with sex. Of course, we need to have adult mature conversations about, you know, consent and appropriate touch and all of those things. But innately, your body is not bad and your desire to have sex is not bad. And so um, that's that's what I like to do. Yeah. So let's explore that a little bit because uh, most of the listeners of She When I Fall are women, but we do have men and I always want men to listen. <laughs> Let me say that. Um, so you have uh, cisgendered women, queer women, and trans women. This space is open for women, whoever identifies as that. Um, <clears throat> and I think we get it the worst when it comes to our sexuality and and having a healthy relationship with sex that is not immersed in shame and all of those things what do you think has been like the biggest barrier that you've seen with people and especially women when it comes to being liberated sexually um especially when they have a church because you know church background jesus christ (laughs) yeah that's a great question so i think for churched women Um, the biggest barrier is this, the ways we've been socialized to think that we're going to go to hell. Like everything is either leading you to heaven or to hell. So, you know, it's the straight and narrow. You got to do it this way. It's a list of rules that you got to cross off. And if not, you going to hell. And so that tactic has been used and it's been used well to convince people that there are so many things that they shouldn't be doing and getting over that barrier, getting over that mindset in order to even engage these conversations has been a really, a really big barrier for liberation. But then even as people open their minds and say, okay, I, I want to engage the conversation. I'm not quite sure you are right, but I'm not quite sure you're wrong. Once they get to that point, um, it's just the questioning of everything. They're like, well, no, that's not what they said. Well, no, that's not what they said. And it's like, okay, take a step back from what they said. Take a, take a step back from what someone taught you. Think about this in, like, in your own way. Take everything else off and just read it for what it is. What do you see here? Getting people to that point, um is is it can be challenging and most of my work engages people who want to learn and who are open to having these conversations but doing the work with people who aren't there and want to be there that's been the biggest barrier because if you're committed to your ignorance then my work is not the place for you because I'm not arguing you arguing you down about whether I'm right or whether I'm wrong we're not doing that but if you're committed to learning and you actually want to have those hard conversations that um those are some of the biggest barriers for liberation and actually being open to the conversations in the first place yeah I think honestly another one that I've seen is the hell issue is definitely one of them the other one is that if you have been liberated sexually or I think people hear liberated sexually and it's like you just sleep with everything and everybody and that's not (laughs) that's not what it means that's not what it means at all that is Um, what it can mean but that's not what it has to mean that's not what it has to mean and I remember I was a part of a church um, one time. It was a white evangelical church and it was very po- it's a very popular church here in Atlanta. Mm-hmm. Um, and <clears throat> the pastor was doing this series about sex. I remember that. And he told this story how this young woman, um, she got really excited because she met this amazing um, guy at a party, I think. And like he would, had Christian values. He had all these things. And she was so excited and she told her mom that she met this guy and her mom was like, well, that's great, but he's not going to want a woman like you. And she began to like, tell her like men like that, who are good like that, they don't want girls like you. They don't want girls who are out here doing whatever, da, 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 da. And in the story, the pastor says the girl fell to the floor and started crying. It was like, oh my gosh, you're right. I think that's the other bear. <laughs> It is that we are not worthy of having good, healthy relationships or that we are not worthy of being with people that other people deem like, oh, they're too good for you. What's too good for me? No, like I'm, I am, I am worthy of having a healthy relationship. I'm worthy of having the relationship that I want. Like, 
there is no <laughs> there is no hesitant like what are you talking about like just because you think I've done certain things that somehow now that removes me I mean I would hear that all the time growing up too like you yeah. know boys don't like certain kind of girls you need to be the kind of girl that he takes home to mom well what does that mean? does that mean that I've never done anything <laughs> like, yeah go ahead yeah and, and so this the conversation of worth and our worth being tied up into one our virginity or this whole notion of body count which is a whole we could have a whole podcast episode about how terrible that is but this whole this whole conversation about worth being tied into chastity or purity or something like that where did where did the chastity and the purity come from who's who's making the rule book to say that this is the this is the only way that you can live this is the only way you can have a healthy sexual relationship or healthy sexual ethic that's not even biblical because like if you're saying that's biblical you clearly don't read the bible like it was all types of marriages going on in the bible so we talk about biblical marriages and everything else under the sun and that's not even an accurate representation of what it's talking about and what you were saying earlier reminded me of a conversation I heard Candace Benbo having as she's been talking about her book, Red Lip Theology, is how we uh, we put worth and value on the, specifically talking about women in this instance, on the women and the girls who are quote unquote pure, who don't, who abstain from sex, who don't go on dates, who wear dresses down to their ankles and don't wear red lipstick and you know, all of those things and how those are the girls that are supposed to get all of the things. But then when those girls grow up and they see the girls who was out here being sexually liberated, getting the husbands that the people told them they were supposed to get, it's like the math isn't math thing. So you told me if I did all these things, I would quote unquote be the prize. But these people were sexually free. They did whatever it was that they wanted to do consensually or whatnot. And they got the thing that you said I was supposed to get and I didn't even get it. And so unpacking how worth is tied into all of that. And it's still all based in shame, which we were talking about earlier, and ultimately this desire of, you know, going to hell or not going to hell. And it's just, it's really loaded. It's so many layers to the conversation and um, the way it's been portrayed and the way it's been taught. It's, yeah. Yeah. I think it was the prophet Cardi B who said, I don't cook, I don't clean. But let Baby. Me you, let me show you how I got Baby. this ring. <laughs> Okay, because I can hire a chef and I can hire a housekeeper for that. Listen, okay. Yeah, I think this is so good. So let me ask this question because we were talking about church girls and especially how do you see the church being in some ways a system of oppression Mm -hmm. towards women? Like how how do you see that? And how do we change that? That's 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 part B to the question. How do you see the church being oppression, being oppressive, especially to women, but then also how do we shift that dynamic? Um, okay, that, that's those are both great questions. So I'm gonna speak specifically um on black church because I know black yeah. church. I don't know white church. I'm sorry to anybody who lives in white church space. That's just not my space. Um, but specifically thinking about the black church, we have to first deal with the patriarchy and the massage and water that's coming from the pulpit, right? So if you think about the people who are quote unquote in control, the people in these pulpits that have the most power and say and influence and authority, their rhetoric is patriarch- patriarchal. Their rhetoric is misogynistic. It's embedded with misogynoir. And so those are the people who are making the decisions. Those are the people who are putting the systems into play. Those are the people who are calling the shots behind the scenes, right? So if if those people aren't willing to have open and honest conversations about the ways that patriarchy and misogyny shows up, they're not going to be willing to have conversations about how to remove it. We should not in 2022 still be debating women in the pulpit. We should not still be having that conversation and it's still very much being had. Mm-hmm. So that's, I think that is the root of where it shows up because at you know, as the Black church was birthed, it was the place that 
Black cis het men had power and authority in the community. They were the end all be all. They had the final say in those spaces. And to a certain extent, we've never fully gotten away from that. And so um, that system and those structures are still embedded in the um, in the underbelly of the Black church. And can you remind me the second part of the question? How do you feel we can rectify that? Like, how do we... With, with patriarchy still being very heavy within especially Black church spaces, um, how do you feel like we can shift that dynamic? Yeah, so um, in the same way that I feel like it's not queer people's job to advocate for queer people, I don't feel like it's women's job in the church to necessarily do the heavy lifting and advocating for women. It's the cis het straight males who are in these rooms who have this influence who need to be leading and guiding and changing these conversations we we don't need the black women are gonna save the world black women are gonna save the church narrative yes we are great yes we are awesome yes we do good work but it's not our job to convince you that we should be there it's not our job to convince you that all of these things that that are set up from the the bylaws all the way down to the way that they're executed need to be undone. The the people who are, have the power and the privilege and who are not hurt by those systems and those structures are the ones who need to be doing the heavy lifting. I say and I mean, I mean all of that. And I also have a theory. Like I feel like black men, especially cis head black men hold on to that power because it gives them access to the power that white men hold in society. So they're able to dictate everything, make, all of that. And so try, letting go of that when they don't have it in real life, well, I hate to say real life, <laughs> when, they don't have it, right, when they don't have it outside the church doors, um, it, it is, it's intoxicating for them, I think. And they just really like the power. It's yeah. Cool. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a power trip. It's a power struggle. It is. So we've heard about the work that you're doing. As you look to the future, what are you hoping to do as far as liberation? What do you see yourself doing future-wise um, to help others get liberated? Uh, this is always such a difficult question for me to answer because I don't like talking about myself um but it's if I think about the work that I want to do um you know moving forward and continuing to do now a lot of what I want to do is bridging the conversations that we had that are had in the academy about sexual ethics and practical theology as it relates to those things and the cap and the conversations that are being had in the local church because I feel like they're decades apart from each other the conversations that are being had in the academy are 20 30 years ahead of the conversations that are being had in the local congregation and if it's only happening in the academic archives how is it changing the lives of the people how is it helping the folk mm -hmm. right so if, you, if I when I think about womanism womanism is for the folk it's for everyone and like we not we doing this work for everybody of course you know we're censoring the experiences of black women but we not just trying to free us we trying to free everybody and so if we're not having those same conversations in the local congregations or you know even for people outside of church in your small groups in your book clubs in whatever way you see yourself doing the ministry and doing the work then what's the point of doing the work right and so as I move forward and as I think about the things I want to do in the future, it's just continuing to find ways to bridge those gaps. Um, writing in a way that's accessible and that doesn't use so many words that nobody knows how to, like, I don't want you to have to have a dictionary and a thesaurus to read my writing. I want you to be able to, to understand it no matter where you are and actually apply it, have applicable steps, have next steps. So, um, 
I have a list of long dreams of things that I want to do. I want to do book clubs. I want to do retreats. I want to write curriculums. I want to do all of those. But at the center of the work that I want to do, it's bringing those conversations that are being had in the academy to your local congregations, to your people who are never going to experience seminary, all of those people. I think it would drastically shift the church if that happened. And I think real liberation would happen when that happens, because it's going to happen. Yeah. Because I always like to say like these, the new church, I don't know. Like, I just feel like it's a new church emerging. So it's we, like, we yeah. in the middle of something, something's going we, on. Something, something is stirring and so, <laughs> something is shifting. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I think that is going to set so many people free because um, it will require folks to think not just digest, but, but really reflect on like for themselves what this means as opposed to just taking what somebody said and like okay but then that's what that means no it requires work it requires a complete reframing right yes and and it makes me think about the saying um and I don't know who's credited with this saying but the saying that you don't know what you don't know so you don't know it Mm mm-hmm and so um, having having those kinds of conversations, opening people up to a different entry point, to a different starting point, just shows how many things you don't know till you don't know. Right. And I think that's the reason why people don't want to, because I think seminary education will have people having more questions than answers. Like everything that you thought you were sure about. Oh, baby. It's going to make you reevaluate some stuff. <laughs> you start questioning the stuff you thought you knew for listen, certain. Listen, I was having a conversation the other day and I was like, look, I don't like the thing that frustrates me about Christians is when they are um, so sure about something that's unsure. It's like you are like you are just so hell bent on that. This is the answer when the thing that we you say is the answer and we're talking about is an unsure thing. We don't know because you haven't experienced it. So that doesn't make any sense. I think you were going to yeah. say something. Right? Oh, I was just going to say that I understand how this work can be scary, right? Engaging in these conversations can be scary because if someone's told you all of your life a list of things to believe in, that's way easier than questioning everything you ever thought you Absolutely. knew, right? And for me, that's one of the reasons it's important for the work to happen in community, whatever that community looks like. If it's a small group, if it's a Bible study, if it's a book club, it don't have to be church. It don't have to be religious spaces. It don't have to be none of that. But in community, doing doing it with other people, so you don't go in down these rabbit holes in your head by yourself. Having somebody else to talk it out with and to to think to think these things through with, I think is really helpful. And so that's why the communal aspect of the work that I want to do is so important. It's not just one-offs. Yeah. It's not just one-on-ones. I love it. That has literally been the consistent theme, I think, thus far is, um, and I, I think Sharifa said it, she said, um, liberation is a group project. And I was like, well, praise the Lord, because <laughs> it is. Yeah. And you need community. Because trying to get liberated by yourself, let me tell you something. Yeah, you you can. <laughs> it's like, I was like, mm. <laughs> this is a lot <laughs> but and the people. more the more you get exposed to the more a lot that it is right. and so you have to have people that can help bring you down off of the hill or help ground you and recenter you because you just you should you just shouldn't be doing this on your own you yeah. should do it in community whatever that community looks like for you so absolutely. yeah absolutely absolutely and I do think that it not only has a emotional effect on you, you probably will have a physical one too, because it's mm-hmm. depending on how immersed you were in wherever you came from, whatever form of theology you came from, it's jarring to your system. And that alone, like when you have, when you're having emotional conflict and things, it can result in your body physically. So that's why I say it's a lot. It's a lot. So it's levels to this. We, we back levels. where we started. We yes. back where we started. It's, it's levels. Levels to this. That's why you say give yourself some grace <laughs> and time. Take your time, time. and give yourself Listen. grace. Yeah. We we that don't part. we have never arrived, but even to the points that we have arrived, it did not happen overnight. So it's a it's a journey. That's how I look at my spiritual journey. That's how I look at the work that I want to do. It's it's a process, it's a journey. We the, we're not gonna get to the finish line. We're just gonna keep checking off little ticks. 
as we yeah. go along the process. So, exactly, yeah. exactly. Mm-hmm. So any final thoughts that you have and then let people know how they can follow you, what you're working on, all of those things. Oh, um, final thoughts. Well, first, thank you so much for inviting me to be on the show. You're doing great work here with She Will Not Fall. (laughs) Um, And so final words to anyone listening or watching, um, I would just encourage you to find your freedom, find your authenticity, and let that guide you on your journey of liberation. Um, whatever that looks like for you doesn't have to look the same for anyone else find exactly what freedom and authenticity looks like for you and allow that to carry you and lead you and guide you throughout your journey I love it how can people find you follow you all of that yeah awesome so um, all of my information you can find it easily at my website is tierneyjordan.com you can follow me on Instagram at I am Tierney J. I have a Twitter. I don't use it. It's the same though. If you would like to follow me there and then you can connect with my podcast at Sassy Spirituality Pod. But all those links are at tierneyjordan.com if that got, if that got long. So uh, yeah, <laughs> I will have all of that in the show notes. So you can click that. Um, Tierney, thank you for taking time out of your schedule versus to have a conversation about liberation. This is a very deep topic, but- Mm -hmm. um, We only scratched the surface. So literally like it's just surface. (laughs) But thank you for being transparent and authentic and, you know, just giving us something to chew on and think about as we keep working towards liberation. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me.